Good evening. Welcome, everybody. And a very warm welcome to Dr. Alessia Kormechuk. We know how incredibly busy you are at the moment, and we're delighted that you can talk to us this evening and help the Bear Trust to launch the next stage of its Ukraine appeal. Um, now, a few housekeeping points to start with. Uh, please keep your audio settings on mute. If you don't mind being seen on screen and on the recording, although we can probably edit that out, uh, please keep your video on. Uh, we are recording the event. Uh, please type questions into the chat. You can do that at any time and we will pick them up after Alessia's talk. Before I introduce Alessia, I'd like to thank everyone who's donated to Bear's Ukraine Appeal since February 2022. We've now raised over £600,000 in total, including pledges for this year and next. I'm going to give a short report now on what our partners on the ground have achieved in these past two years and how we plan to continue supporting them. So this is where the money has gone so far. 85% of it to partners in Ukraine and 15% to partners in Moldova, which of course received a disproportionate number of refugees. The way the Bear Trust provides humanitarian aid is to send small grants of cash to local voluntary organizations. These are mostly small community-based groups. We can do this because we already had a network of contacts in Ukraine and Moldova from our regular work in the region on issues of health and social welfare. And through that work, we had also learned a lot about the dynamism of civil society in Ukraine. We now know that immediately after the full-scale invasion, most humanitarian aid for displaced people was not organized by the big international aid groups. It was organized by local NGOs, church groups, and hundreds of newly formed local aid, local aid groups. And that was not a surprise to us. We were able to start with partners we'd worked with before and trusted, and we quickly added more organizations through recommendation and word of mouth. Speed was of the essence, so we used light touch application forms. Our partners told us what was needed, and we tried to get the money to them as quickly as the international payment system would allow. And we've now sent more than 260 separate grants. Our 2022 annual report has a long list of the supplies that our partners provided, if you'd like to see it. Food, clothing, bedding, household and hygiene supplies, torches, generators, fuel for deliveries and evacuations, and so on. And increasingly, our partners are giving psychological trauma support. This is mainly community-based work, art, music, gardening, and so on, rather than medical treatment. And we've also given some grants for the organisations themselves to help their resilience. People are exhausted and need resources for training or taking time out for team building or brainstorming and planning. Sadly, everyone now has to think longer term. As you can see, the Bear Trust grants are widely distributed and some of our partners have received several grants. And we're very encouraged that some of them are now able to access funds from the larger age agencies who contact us as part of their own due diligence. So it seems that working with Bear has helped our partners to demonstrate what they can achieve on the ground. So what amounts of money are we talking about? Well, we've now received more than half a million pounds, uh, just under 540,000 pounds. And we have pledges and other funds in the pipeline for 24 and 25 that bring total fundraising to well over 600,000 pounds. We've sent just over 524,000 pounds to partners in Ukraine and Moldova. Now we ourselves were stunned by the response when we launched the appeal. That blue line on the graph is quite striking. I think the response partly reflected the sheer shock of the full scale invasion and the generosity, the strong desire to help people who are suffering because of it. I think it also reflected our own fundraising pledge that we would send 100% of donations received to our partners on the ground. Um, I, some of you know that Bears trustees manage the campaign as volunteers, and we cover any admin costs and bank charges from other funds. Another attraction of our campaign is that we could move fast. 
If you compare income and expenditure, you can see that our dispatch rate is 97%. As I said before, we work to get the money out as quickly as we can. I should also say that £50,000 of our funds has come from the British government for a project run by the British Embassy in Kiev. This involves several of our partners. It's called From Group Therapy to Community Cohesion, and you can read more about it on our website. Now, you can see from the graph that we've achieved a sort of steady state in funding over the past year, and this is what we'd like to continue if we can. We're now looking at the cumulative effects of war since 2014. There are still many local community groups and more remote areas that are not supported by the larger age agencies, and we would like to carry on filling that gap. How can we measure the impact of this half a million plus pounds already sent to Ukraine and Moldova? Well, we know that the money translated very quickly into supplies and help provided on the ground. I'm showing here just four of hundreds of photos our partners have sent us, and also some extracts from their reports. We don't ask for lengthy reports, but it's great that most of our partners want to show the help they're giving, uh, and you can read some of the feedback here. The other two photos I've included here are of wonderful fundraising events that Bear supporters organised for the Ukraine Appeal. And there have been many of these. They range from a tea party organised by a brownie pack in Scotland to an art sale by an artist in Hertfordshire who offered his life's work for the appeal. And here on the slide, we can see Flora Hudson running the Rotterdam Marathon for Bear. And those cakes in the bottom right hand corner are being served at a plant sale supported by the Royal Horticultural Society of Ireland that raised tens of thousands of pounds for the appeal. And as we relaunch the appeal, I'm very pleased to announce a collaboration with staff members of the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. So many thanks to Stanislav Sukrinenko of the EBRD for initiating this. We'll put the link to Stanislav's campaign in the chat and it'll be on the homepage of the Bear website later this evening. What I'd like to draw to your attention is that the EBRD's Community Initiative Fund will match the first 6,000 euros raised. In other words, donate early and double the impact of your donation. If you're quick, you can actually scan that QR code on the screen, but as I say, it will be on our website later tonight. Please do support it and pass the word round. There are so many causes needing our support at the moment, but we would like, in our modest way, to keep our support for Ukraine going. I know that for some of you, Dr. Olesia Hromechuk hardly needs an introduction, whether as a Cambridge historian, director of the Ukrainian Institute in London, and an authoritative voice on Ukraine's history and identity, or perhaps as the author of The Death of a Soldier Told by His Sister. The fact that Alessia's brother was killed in 2017 is a reminder that the war was going on for several years before the full-scale invasion. It's hard to realise that Alessia wrote this book in English, her second language. She is a brilliant communicator, and if you haven't already seen it, I recommend watching her recent TED talk what the world can learn from Ukraine's fight for democracy. Her talk tonight is titled Loss, Defiance and the Fight for Justice. And I can exclusively reveal that you are having a preview of a version of an article to be published this week in the NATO Review. Alessia has kindly agreed to take questions afterwards, so please write your questions into the chat. Alessia, thank you, welcome, and over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for that really generous introduction. And it's, a, it's an honor for me to uh, support this relaunch of your Ukraine appeal. Um, and thank you most of all for standing with Ukraine at a time when it's not in the headlines as much as it used to be. And there's a temptation to assume that maybe our help is 
no longer needed in the same way. Well, it is needed um, now, perhaps more than ever. So thank you for your work. Um, I will talk a little bit about, I will share some of the observations of the last two years or possibly even going beyond that to the beginning of the war 10 years ago in my introduction. And then I'll uh, also share um, three stories of three women from Ukraine with you. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions and having a discussion after. Ukraine became an object of interest because of the act of aggression directed at it. It has gained visibility around the globe because Russia has tried to render it invisible. Being seen, however, is not the same as being understood. To truly understand Ukraine, we need to listen to Ukrainians talk about themselves in their own words and on their own terms. We need to trust them with their knowledge of themselves and question our own, often imperialist, frameworks of the world. After all, it is the habit of listening to a great power that has made us preoccupied with the perpetrator when we should be focusing on the nation that it attacks. It has led us to mistake Russia for the country we wish it to be rather than the one it really is and pushed us to direct our energies towards ensuring Russia's survival rather than planning for its demise. This lack of understanding of Ukraine's subjectivity, its history and vision of the future meant that at least until February 2022, for much of the world, Ukraine was not so much a country, but a territory, a land that could be fought over, divided and controlled by others, a buffer zone. Buffer zones in our imagination don't have clear identities. We don't sympathize with the people who inhabit them in the same way as we do with places that come to mean something to us through knowledge that we acquire about them. It is easy to turn a buffer zone into a war zone. This perception of the country outside of Ukraine has frequently been shaped through the eyes of Moscow and found especially fertile ground in those cultures that themselves had an imperial past and thus gave credibility to another empire more willingly than they did to the subaltern. It penetrated the media, the political sphere, and academia, and this had real life consequences because the way Ukraine is written about, the way it is taught, is the way it will be imagined and understood by the political elites, by journalists, diplomats, the army, and others who communicate uh, this knowledge to the general population. Two years into the full-scale war, you'd think that our understanding of the country would be different, and it has certainly improved, but there's still a long way to go. Do you know which author I reread after the 24th of February 2022? A man asked me recently in a way that implied that he anticipated being praised for his choice. I had a feeling I wouldn't like the answer, so I didn't say anything in response. Dostoevsky, said the man, who specialized in European culture. I was silent. He didn't get the expected gratification, so he went on to explain his decision. I needed to understand the Russian society, how they came to wage such a war, he added. And what Ukrainian author did you read to understand why Ukrainians are resisting so? I asked in return. It was his turn to fall silent. The misunderstanding of Ukraine and the lack of critical assessment of Russia has played a crucial role in the unfolding of this war. Russia's cultivation of its image abroad, attained through soft power, disinformation, and the manipulation of individuals and institutions via bribes and blackmail, has secured the enduring admiration of the West for the so-called great Russian culture. As a result, it succeeded in overshadowing the voices that would offer a different perception of the region. We have primarily gained our understanding of East Central Europe, Central Asia, and North Caucasus from the perspectives provided by Moscow. In other words, we've given heed to the oppressor instead of seeking out the perspectives of the oppressed. Russia didn't simply enjoy authority, credibility, and impunity over the years. It benefited from the crimes that it committed. In the meantime, the voices on the receiving end of cultural, economic, and finally military violence it inflicted were largely dismissed to the point that Ukraine was predicted to fall in three days when Russia started its full-scale invasion. 
Now, two years later, Ukraine continues to stand strong, but it also continues to be mistrusted, especially when it comes to its views of what constitutes victory. The less we trust it with its experience, needs, and choices, the more we contribute to the prolongation of the war. So we must stop treating Ukraine as a buffer zone. We also need to remember that it is more than a war zone. It has become a war zone precisely because it was invisible to the rest of the world for so long and pushed to the margins of our imagination. So in my talk today, I'd like to share three stories of three Ukrainian women. And I hope that their voices can help us gain a more nuanced, perhaps in-depth view of Ukraine as it finds itself two years into the full-scale war and a decade since the war was started by Russia. Natalia. I asked the receptionist at the Lviv Hotel I was staying in if she had any sellotape I could borrow. I had an important package to deliver and it was crucial for it to be well wrapped. The woman handed her stationery set to me and I perched on the edge of a chair in the hotel lobby to get on with my mission. The package I was wrapping could not be sent by ordinary mail. I had to deliver it personally because its destination was in the world of the dead. Having ensured that the parcel was as waterproof as possible, I returned the tape and the scissors to the receptionist, jumped in a taxi and headed to the Lechakiv Cemetery, the main burial ground of the city of Lviv, my hometown. When Russia started its war against Ukraine in 2014, the military section of the cemetery was expanded with the graves of new war dead. I'm very familiar with the large granite crosses featuring photos of the fallen and the golden engraving to the eternal memory of the hero. One of them bears the name in a photo of my brother, Volodya, killed in action in 2017. His grave is the first and the last place I visit on my trips to Ukraine. In fact, every spare moment I have, I spend there. It's the only place where the wound in my heart bleeds a little less. This time, however, as soon as the ta taxi dropped me off at the cemetery, I did not go to my brother's grave. I headed straight to an adjacent area with an apt name, the Field of Mars. The Soviets buried their military dead there after they had annexed Western Ukraine in the aftermath of the Second World War. Before that, this field had contained the remains of soldiers of the Austrian army killed in the Great War. When Russia escalated its war in 2022, the war dead were too great in numbers to be contained in the military pantheon where my brother is laid to rest. They started to be buried in the field of Mars. Holding, holding hundreds of new graves and counting, the spillover burial is now larger than the original pantheon. As I approached the field, I was overwhelmed by the sheer number of new graves, a sea of flags and burning candles beside them. There were many more than the last time I had visited a few months earlier. My package was to be delivered to one of them. I didn't know the man who was buried there. I knew his first name was Andriy. I also knew that I, I also knew that his last name was the same as that of his sister, although I didn't know her personally either. One night, while watching the news at home in London, I saw her interviewed beside, beside her brother's grave and recognized the spot, the field of Mars in my hometown. I also recognized the feelings she was conveying. She said she would never forgive the Russians for her brother's death. The package I was delivering was for Natalia, a fellow grieving sister. My book, The Death of a Soldier Told by a Sister, had just come out in Ukrainian, and I wanted her to have it, hoping that it might soothe her pain at least a little, or, failing that, remind her that she was not alone. As I couldn't find Natalia online, my only option was to leave my book wrapped in as much plastic as the autumn weather called for in one place I knew she'd visit, her brother's final resting place. When I located Andrei's grave, I noticed it was overflowing with flowers. I was sure Natalia must visit often. I tucked my book in between flower beds together with a message of apologies for intruding into her grief. Around 80% of Ukrainians know someone who had been either killed or injured in this war. 
In addition to the military losses, there are mounting civilian casualties from Russia's relentless strikes on schools, kindergartens, hospitals, and ordinary residential buildings. Whole communities are destroyed. Mariupol, Bakhmut, Popasna, Rubizhne, Avdiivka, these are all ghost towns. Almost 4 million individuals are internally displaced, and over 6 million Ukrainians have sought refuge globally. Many have lost contacts with their loved ones. PTSD and other types of trauma are widespread and will pose a channel, a challenge not only for war veterans, but for the whole of society. Ukraine is a country that is drowning in grief, but the grief only fuels the fight. Ukrainians are not protected by defensive alliances other than those that they create themselves. The Ukrainian armed forces are an embodiment of an alliance between society and the military. The army relies on the hard work of vast volunteer movement to fill the gaps in procurement. Friends and families of those who serve regularly raise funds for various items ranging from drones to first aid kits. The army also relies on civilians for its new recruits. Therefore, a military death often means the killing of someone who was a civilian only yesterday. High losses in the army mean that more civilians will take up arms tomorrow. The Ukrainian armed forces are a citizen army. A large proportion of it consists of people from all walks of life who either voluntarily joined up or were drafted for service during the different waves of mobilization since 2014 and especially after February 2022. These men and women took up arms not out of professional choice, but out of sheer necessity. They gave up their civilian lives to protect the lives of their loved ones and to ensure the Ukrainians could choose the democratic future that they had been building and not the one that an authoritarian occupier wishes to impose on them. In the interview Natalia gave beside her brother's grave, she said that she had tried to prevent him from joining up but he insisted on fighting. She tried to protect him from death. Instead, he died while protecting his country. I don't know if Natalia found my book. If she did, I can only hope that it provided some solace to her. Andriana. Mom, remember when we were a family and we loved each other? Andriana Arechta, a special unit sergeant in the Ukrainian Armed Forces, relays a conversation she had with her son. Interviewed for a BBC documentary, she is struggling to hold back her tears. It's been months since she held her little boy. At the time of the interview, Andriana was convalescing in a military hospital following severe injuries sustained in action. Her unit did not have an armored vehicle and was relying on a civilian car sourced by the volunteers. So when she drove over a landmine near Kherson in 2022, she didn't have the protection that an armored vehicle would provide and was lucky to have survived the blast. Andriana is well known in Ukraine as one of the founders of the women's volunteer movement. She has been demonized in Russia as a Nazi executioner, a World War II term used by the Soviets to describe the Nazi death squads. I know Andriana as a shy but utterly determined woman. I met her in 2018 when she came to the UK to promote Invisible Battalion, a documentary film about the lives of women on the front line. During this period, many around the globe succumbed to the Kremlin propaganda about a so-called internal conflict in Eastern Ukraine and chose to regard Russia as a mediator for peace rather than a perpetrator of war. The service women, therefore, had to do some basic explaining about the war, its origins and likely escalation before they were able to talk about the gendered nature of their service. Andriana was a perfect ambassador for this pur purpose. She joined the volunteer battalion straight after the Maidan protests in 2014, when it turned out that it wasn't enough to defend democracy on the barricades. It also had to be defended on the battlefield. She served as a shock trooper, but was formally registered as a seamstress. The paternalistic legacy of the Soviet law prevented women from accessing a vast majority of army occupations. 
However, the need for all professions at the front line was immense, and women were placed in those jobs that needed to be done, even if on paper their involvement was limited to the rear. Invisible Battalion grew into a powerful advocacy campaign, spearheaded by a group of women veterans and feminist scholars. They assessed the precarious position of women in the armed forces and lobbied for the law to be amended. The result was astonishing. Not only was the law revised, the efforts of the activists also drew attention to the gendered perception of service in Ukraine. In, in the early years of the war, media coverage seemed to oscillate between sensationalizing women who followed their men to the trenches and demonizing the ones who should have known that the war was not a place for women. Invisible battalion activists challenged such misrepresentations and insisted on judging women in the military by their accomplishments and not by their gender. Through their efforts, they succeeded in gradually um, altering both media depictions and societal attitudes towards service women. Andriana was among those active in the campaign. While fighting against obstacles that prevented her and her fellow service women from serving unhindered by structural and habitual discrimination, she realized, however, that her biggest adversary was the misogynistic enemy. Aware of the numerous accounts of torture and sexual violence against women in Russian captivity, Andriana chose her nom de guerre carefully. She was known as Malish, kid. Using the noun in masculine form meant that if communication mentioning her was intercepted by the Russians or their proxies, they wouldn't have suspected the fighter to be a woman. The Russian army uses rape as a method of warfare. The extent of conflict-related sexual violence perpetrated by Russian troops became clear to the world only in 2022, following the liberation of the occupied regions, which exposed the magnitude of the crimes. Ukrainians knew what to expect from the ex escalation of the war. They were aware of the fellow citizens in occupied Crimea and in parts of eastern Ukraine um, had been deprived of all basic rights by the occupying authorities for years. That is why, following the full-scale invasion, not only men, but thousands of women joined the armed forces. Some were motivated by the need to be armed should the enemy approach their homes, while others felt a strong sense of duty to defend their country. Whatever their reasons for joining the ranks, as of October 2023, over 62,000 women were enlisted in the Ukrainian army. Over 43,000 of them were service women. In contrast to the presence of women in the armed forces in 2014, there has been an almost 25% overall increase, with the number of service women more than doubling. Having taken her son to safety in February 2022, Andriana rejoined the military. I've lost more than 100 friends. I don't even know how many phone numbers I need to delete, she tells the BBC crew. They took the best years of my life. She adds, they even took my dreams. In spite of her grave injuries, Andriana is determined to make a full recovery and return to the front. She is determined to go on fighting, so her son won't have to. Victoria. In public discussions, I am frequently asked why Ukrainians are so focused on achieving victory and justice rather than ceasefire and peace. Despite being the ones losing their citizens, Ukrainians remain determined to fight for as long as it takes. This question typically comes from individuals who do not understand that Moscow is a repressive imperialist power that is not interested in playing by the rules of a democratic order. In order to maintain at least an appearance of its imperial might, it has to constantly expand its borders, turning sovereign states um, in its neighborhood into a buffer zone. The only way to secure peace with it is to defeat it. So far, Russia has gotten away with perpetrating crimes not only in Ukraine, but also in Chechnya, Georgia, Syria, and other parts of the world where its mercenaries operate. It has benefited from the impunity granted to it by world leaders who continued to trade with the aggressor and thus facilitated its ability to wage wars. 
the testimonies of those who record Russian war crimes and speak out against impunity are vital if we are to break the pattern of aggression and bring the perpetrators to justice. That is why the invading Russian army was equipped with a hit list of activists when it staged the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. The occupying Russian troops brought not only parade uniforms with them at the beginning of the invasion, but they also brought body bags, said Ukrainian author Victoria Amelina, while being interviewed at Hay Festival in January 2023. They expected to take Ukraine in three days, and we are pretty sure that those body bags were for writers, for mayors, for people whom we see tortured and murdered in the occupied territories, she added. In June 2023, Victoria was killed in a Russian missile strike on a restaurant. Following her death, her colleagues at PEN Ukraine started a project on people of culture killed in Russia's war. Victoria's story is now added to their somber database. A novelist, poet, and children's book writer, Victoria trained herself to become a war crimes investigator following Russia's full-scale invasion. She traveled around the liberated territories and spoke to survivors of the occupation. She was determined to document their testimonies of war crimes because lies thrive on untold truths. Victoria wrote that when stories such as those of the Holocaust or the Holodomor are not fully revealed, we're bound not to trust each other. Who were you, the hungry one or the one taking all the food in 1933? The scared one watching from the window when Jews were taken away, or the one who took them in? The questions Victoria poses remain relevant today. Who were we in 2014? The ones who tolerated Russia's aggression and turned a blind eye to the violation of international law in the middle of Europe, or the ones who pushed against Russia's impunity? Who were we in 2022? The ones who claimed Ukraine would fall in three days, or the ones who campaigned to provide it with all it needed to withstand the attack. Who will we be as this war continues? The ones who will insist on a ceasefire that will bring more body bags with the next wave of invasion? Or will we be the ones who will stay invested in Ukraine's victory so that its people can see justice and begin to heal? Natalia, Andriana, and Victoria represent the experiences of many Ukrainians. The shared trauma from increasing losses, the unwavering determination for victory, and the yearning for justice as the key to lasting peace are prevalent throughout society. What is lacking is trust in the democratic world. Is it prepared to do all it takes to see Ukraine succeed and thus protect democracy globally? Thank you. I'll stop there. Alessia, thank you so much for those very moving stories. I hope people will ask you some questions. Please type them into the chat. Um, I, Alessia is very keen to answer your questions. I wonder if I could start with one myself. Sure. Um, I, I was very interested to hear about the extraordinary role that volunteers have been play, uh, playing. Um, volunteering to fight in the army um, and also uh, the ones running the little community-based organizations helping people who are displaced or, or who are unable to leave their homes and of course these are the people that, that we have been working with through our appeal. Um, what I wanted to ask you was what sort of shape you would like to see in civil society in the future and obviously hoping very much here for the victory and justice outcome um, but it's clear that civil society was flourishing in Ukraine before the war and it, it has as, 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 it, it is very dynamic but what role do you think it will play in Ukrainian society in the future? Hmm. It's a great question. Thank you so much for letting me speak about it. I do really like to draw attention to civil society in Ukraine because it is. I think it is something that wasn't really um, 
studied sufficiently by those commentators who were commenting on the situation in Ukraine two years ago, this time two years ago when Ukraine was predicted not to last more than a week or so. Um, uh, and, and, and that's one of the reasons I think Ukraine was underestimated is because um, the attention was drawn to maybe political elites, uh, some other processes, but not to the strength of civil society groups. Ukrainian civil society has been strong, historically speaking. Um, again, this is something that I've written about and spoken about elsewhere, um, that um, our lack of statehood uh, is often perceived as a weakness. And in general, you know, lack of long tradition of statehood tends to be perceived as weakness in states. We tend to think of states with long traditions of democratic rule, but just statehood, generally speaking, even if it's not a democracy, Russia can hardly be described as democracy, um, as somehow more authoritative than those who lacked statehood. Or, and in the Ukrainian case, it was restored only over three decades ago. Um, but for Ukrainians, this lack of statehood meant self-organization, the need to come together in times of crises, the need to stand up to the oppressor, the need to self-organize into community organizations to preserve their language, to preserve their culture, to publish in underground literature, to disseminate that literature, you know, to run a kind of shadow society in the times when you were not allowed to practice your identity openly. And I think it equipped us then not only to survive the repressions of imperial time, of, of the Soviet Empire, of the Soviet Union, but also to then demand appropriate rights when the Soviet Union collapsed. I mean, that's why the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, to stand up for our rights subsequently, so in the various revolutions we've had, and here I mean the revolution in the granite, but also Orange Revolution and of course, the revolution of dignity, the Maidan revolution of 2014. Um, and it's really from 2014 that we've seen this absolutely fascinating strength of Ukrainian civil society that managed to, in some ways, replace state institutions. State institutions were weakened by the change of government, by also by previous, you know, the Yanukovych's regime that was uh, flirting with authoritarianism. They needed to be strengthened. It takes time. So the people themselves took it uh, upon themselves to essentially, you know, fill the gaps. And I think they continue to do that really, really successfully today. Um, and what we also often don't talk about is that a lot of these civil society organizations are run and volunteers are run by women. Mm. Uh, our focus, this is also about whose voice do we uh, hear, whose voice do we listen to and perceive as authoritative. A lot of our attention tends to go to the military, understandably, to politicians, also understandably, most of them are men, <laughs> not just in Ukraine. Um, and we don't necessarily hear the voices of those people who get on with it on a daily basis, work really, really hard, often unpaid or for very little remuneration and um, make things happen um, in, in, uh, in NGO civil society organizations and volunteer organizations. But I'm not answering your question. You can see I feel very strongly about this, about this question. Um, you asked what role I, I, I envisage. Well, I think when people ask me what gives me hope, um, especially in these kind of democratic processes in Ukraine, moving on, um, it's civil society. It's the fact that we've organized in the past. We will organize. We are organized now through such terrible hardship. We will stay organized in the future. I have no doubt that Ukrainians will be just as keen to keep their politicians accountable for the lack of reform or the speed of reform in the future as they are now, that they will ensure that this freedom of speech, I mean, in the middle of the war, we still uh, have huge debates, very heated debates about um, the state of the media and, you know, the state of defense and so on in the media. So there's definitely freedom of speech. So I see the role of Ukrainian civil society as the, you know, th that powerful mechanism that monitors the health of the state mm -hmm. and ensures that it remains healthy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you. You made some very interesting comments about the gender issues. Um, and, and, and as you say, a lot of the NGOs are, are run by women. A lot are run by men. In, in, I know that some of our partners um, the people who run them are, are men and they're on the 
um, actually listening to you this evening, which is wonderful. Um, but I wonder if I could pick up a, a question I can see from Sue Wiper, who asked, do you think the role of women will be changed in Ukrainian society after the war and how? Yes, great question. Another one of those I can talk about for hours, so stop me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's already changed. So I give you an example of the armed forces in my talk, uh, and it's I think it's very indicative to how it changes. I used to be one of those skeptics, uh, skeptic um, feminists who said uh, to my uh, friends who joined the army, don't join the army, you will legitimize an institution that's not interested in, in reforming itself. Uh, in terms of gender equality, um, you know, our, even collectively, our force is far too small to change such a such a powerful, strong institution. And I am very happy to admit that I was wrong. Um, it's possible to apply pressure in Ukraine. It's possible to introduce grassroots changes from below, and we see them. And the army is a clear example of that. But for me, what warms my heart is this, it's not just, you know, the legal reform that I was talking about, the change of law, um, the change in provisions, although that's, don't get me wrong, that's far from ideal. I mean, Ukraine, Ukrainian armed forces only just started to uh, issue un uniform appropriate for, for female recruits. And I believe the bullet has only just been... Um, adopted but hasn't been issued yet so there's there's a lot of practical and um, structural changes that we still need to see happen but the vital moves are there and they're happening and the what gives me a lot of hope is that I've changed I've seen a lot of change in attitude uh, as I mentioned in, in the talk um, that service women are not perceived as um, as a sort of curiosity or deviation of the norm they are perceived the citizens who made that choice to to join the armed forces and, and do their duty of defending the country that way. Um, what role do I see uh, for women in the future? Well, the, the role they choose to play, right? I want to see more of them uh, in all spheres of society being visible, audible, and trusted. So enjoying the kind of credibility that they deserve with their experience. I know that a lot of them are playing a huge role abroad at the moment, because if you look at the displaced community, it's mostly women with dependents because of the nature of displacement. Men are um, not as able to leave the country as women are. Um, and they've become citizen ambassadors. They talk about Ukraine, they explain Ukraine, they, uh, they've become full-time Ukrainians, uh, whether they chose to be so or not. So I, I guess it's really up to us, all of us collectively, to make sure that the changes that we see, the empowerment of women that we see in the war is not for the duration of the war only, as we've seen in history in the past, as we've seen in the First World War, Second World War, uh, and, and, and across the world with wars. Um, I think it's, la it's going to be lasting. I think we will be able to consolidate the positive changes that we see today in the future. But I also see it as my role and our role uh, as international community, as Ukrainians, to make sure that uh, those positive changes are consolidated and that there isn't a rollback. Thank you. Um, on the question of the number of people who are displaced and living abroad, I, I wonder if we could take a, a question that Janet Gunn has asked. Um, the Ukrainian government wants refugees to return to work in the economy. Do you and other compatriots who are outside the country discuss this and what are your thoughts on this yes it's i think it's um something that will keep changing um i remember a f bosnian friend of mine reached out to me in the early days of the full-scale war and warned me that a lot of refugees will stay in in the the new host countries and i remember replying to her and saying no 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 no. this is a very different situation families are split a lot of men stay behind these are mostly women with dependents they will want to go back lots of people have left careers and so on and and i was right in in many ways because as soon as we saw the liberation of kiev oblast for instance we, we saw a huge amount of people return to ukraine i remember at some point my friends who were traveling a lot back and forth via poland were saying that the trains going into Ukraine are overflowing. It's impossible to get the tickets 
and the trains coming out of Ukraine are actually quite empty. So there was more movement back into the country than out of the country. So a lot of people returned as soon as they were able to do so. But of course, a lot of people stay. Um, and the longer the stay, they stay in their home uh, host countries in their new communities, the, the harder it's going to be for them to return. Um, I suppose it's, it's our uh, role to make sure that um, the host communities are prepared to continue to receive them, that we minimize any possible tensions that arise. We see them appear here and there around Europe, but also that um, it is, of course, it is the, the role of the Ukrainian state to ensure that there is something to return to, that there is a certain stability, employment, um, and the future for, for these people to return to. And I think we as uh, charities, as people who work very closely with Ukraine can help in many cases, because what do people return to? I mean, they need to make sure that the schools are functioning, that there are services provided for them, um, you know, that, that there is employment and so on. And I think in many cases, we um, we have a role to play there as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's difficult for me to, to answer this question because the, the situation keeps changing. I know that the vast majority of people um, can't wait to go back. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I mean, it's a very interesting question, what kind of society people will go back to. And, and there are a couple of questions that, that touch on that. Um, maybe the, the first one I'd like to take, um, because this touches on the question of the role of oligarchs and so on, and, and that sort of vexed question of, of, of corruption uh, and getting corruption out of the system. So this is a question from Daphne Sanders, who, like many of us, enjoyed watching the TV series Servant of the People. And she asks, how has the role of Ukrainian oligarchs evolved or changed since the war started or, or since the full scale invasion? I'm not sure I'm the most qualified person to answer this question, so I'll just share my observation, but also, you know, point you in the direction of um, people who specifically look at uh, um, the changing role of oligarchs and uh, the fight with corruption in Ukraine. But what I'd like to say is that Ukrainians have been fighting against corruption, again, going back to civil society. For as long as I remember, at least since the 90s, um, and very successfully fighting against corruption, corruption since 2014. And again, we see all of these cases discussed uh, absolutely openly in the Ukrainian media every time they appear. Because it's in our interest. It's not about ticking boxes for European Union requirements uh, or... Um, receiving grants from abroad or anything like that. It's in our interest to build society that is free from corruption. Now, corruption is not a, a unique Ukrainian problem. We all know that. Wherever we are <laughs> gathered here from different parts of the world, I'm sure we can all think of, well, I certainly can, and you know, speaking from London, of cases of corruption in those countries where we are. Um, but we tend to focus on uh, the sort of corruption cases like Ukraine, because they are a lot more visible, I think, uh, than, than those that we experience, for instance, in the UK. But I am more than hopeful, because every time I go back to Ukraine, I see it in practice. I see um, how there is no expectation to give bribes. I mean, I'm someone who's who's, who's never given a bribe in, in her life. I left as a, as a young person, and I was spared uh, that, uh, that practice. But I also see that there is absolutely no expectation now that I go back and I have to deal with some, you know, bureaucracy and so on in, in Ukraine. And in fact, there's um, uh, clear signs that people see it as 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 offensive, as insulting if somebody assumes that they would like to uh, perhaps um, thank people in 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 some ways. Um, uh, for for services or, or so on, in in addition to the what's expected of them. So on the kind of grassroots level, I see huge change. I see change in um, in attitudes uh, among fellow citizens. On the level of media monitoring and civil society monitoring, it's 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 enormous. It's uh, very open, and and, and the discussions are are there. 
um, on the level of um, higher up, the higher up you go, the slower I think the process gets. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I believe in people power and I believe in pressure from below to make sure that above changes as well. Thank you. Um, tangentially related to that, what insights do you have about what's been happening in the occupied areas since the invasion? Um, Stuart Young has asked, what methods of cultural suppression are we seeing in the occupied areas? Yes, uh, thank you. Again, I, I haven't done any research myself on that, but uh, I would specifically encourage you to watch a recent discussion we held at the Ukrainian Institute with um, Opora representatives and a couple of other spokespeople from other organizations that work specifically with young people in occupied territories. It's on our website, on, on our YouTube channel, um, Ukrainian Institute London. Um, and what they've been talking about uh, in particular is not just um, the obvious, you know, deprivation of basic uh, human rights that we've all heard of, but also the um, inability to practice one's identity um, and specifically how it affects children. So that was that was very powerful to hear the testimonies from. And they also brought a couple of young people with them to the discussion so we could hear um, first hand testimonies as well. Um, so the, the complete change of educational system, for instance, the the young people are forced to um, uh, to study according to Russian educational system, distortion of not just history, but uh, um, any sort of perception of Ukrainian identity. They can't uh, speak the language. They are discouraged from practicing their identity. And their parents are threatened with um, having their parental rights removed if they disobey these rules, these new rules. So it's a really frightening environment to um, obviously to find yourself in, but also to raise uh, to raise your children and the other thing is so we're talking about the, the recently occupied territories since since 2022 um but let's not forget about those that have been occupied for 10 years now so crimea and parts of eastern ukraine militarization of young people is a massive problem militarization generally speaking but especially of the uh, younger generation is a huge problem i mean let's not forget that some of them were eight when the war started another 18 there, you know, especially young men are being forcefully recruited into uh, the army to essentially fight against their fellow citizens. Um, uh, but this is, I mean, we can talk about this for a long time, and we, we indeed should talk about this um, separately. Uh, Yaroslava Barbieri is another scholar who's been working in Birmingham and producing really good work on um, assessment of um, the situation in the occupied territories. So, yeah, um, maybe I'll end with these pointers. P please yes. look at the work of those people. Yes, that, thank you very much for, for those. Yes, um, somebody's saying they have their passports. Thank you, Mori. So thank you for, for reminding me. Of course, they 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 are forced to, it's it's a forced par par passportization. They are forced to take Russian passports without which they can't do very much. They can't access health services. They can't receive pensions, salaries, and so on. But also even these passports that were given out on in different parts of temporarily occupied territories, they are seen as a kind of second-class Russian passports. So for instance, if those people wanted to travel uh, into Russia with those, they wouldn't be able to um, receive services and access, I don't know, medical care and so on there as well. So it's a, it's essentially a deprivation of citizenship uh, and therefore rights of citizens in, in those parts. Yeah. yeah, I think I think we've time for one more question, and I think it would be good to take Heather Stacy's question because uh, going back to your conversation with the reader of Dostoevsky. Um, Heather writes she's very interested in the question of decolonialization in relation to Ukraine and Belarus. And what Ukrainian authors would you recommend for mm -hmm. someone wanting to improve their understanding of the country in that context? Oh, where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> um, why don't I give you... Um... Two classics uh, recommendation and a couple of contemporary writers. Um, 
So the classics, Tara Shevchenko, you have to start with Tara Shevchenko, I guess, um, a 19th century founder of the nation. Um, his famous phrase, uh, keep fighting and you will prevail. I mean, it's a motto that keeps us going. Um, and we prevail. <laughs> That's the most important thing um, if we keep fighting. So, yeah. Please do start with Tara Shevchenko. I would also recommend Lesya Ukrainka, uh, Fadis Yekla writer, uh, especially her dramas. And we're very lucky to have a new um, new translation of one of her fantastic dramas, Cassandra, a story of Troy told from a point of view of a woman of Cassandra, a painful story for Ukrainians to retell at the moment because it's essentially about a woman who sees the future but nobody believes her. <laughs> Um, please read it. It's an, it's appeared recently in Nina Tran, uh, Nina Murray's translation, um, uh, published by Harvard uh, Harvard University Press. Um, there's there's an absolute fantastic um, collection of uh, Ukrainian avant-garde writers, of modernist writers. Some of them already appear in translation. Um, we've recommended quite a few uh, at Ukrainian institutes, so search on our website and our social media and also uh, Harvard and Cambridge um, Ukrainian studies, um, as well as other Ukrainian studies. I'm, I'm nervous now because I fear that I'll forget some of my colleagues uh, in different parts of the world. And the contemporary books, again, this is just a selection based on my own um, on my own. Uh, uh, choices. I always recommend Olena Stiashkina. She's a writer from Donetsk, uh, who was displaced in 2014, moved to Kyiv, continues to write, switched from Russian to Ukrainian, um, writes really extremely powerfully. She, she's a historian herself uh, as well, um, but, but, but an absolutely fantastic writer. Please discover the writing of Victoria Amelina, the woman I mentioned today. It breaks my heart to uh, it breaks my heart that she became well known <laughs> known around the world because of the obituaries that were written about her after she was killed uh, in the missile strike last summer, and not because of her writing. Uh, I would like people to know her writing. Um, and I would also recommend nonfiction by Stanislav Asseyev, uh, again, um, someone from Donetsk who survived isolation, a concentration camp um, set up by Russian proxies and the Russians when they occupied um, Eastern Ukraine in 2014. Um, I was a journalist uh, and, and is now part of the Ukrainian armed forces. And yesterday we celebrated uh, international writers day and he posted, uh, tweeted, some photos from the trenches um, congratulating everybody uh, with uh, International Writers' Day. Um, basically, read anything you can find. There's a wonderful... Now, Artem Chekh is another writer. I can keep going. There's a wonderful selection for every possible taste. Now, luckily, already in English translation and in some other translations, I think the most important thing is that we read and that we share those writers that we found. Um, uh, with others and we spread uh, information about Ukrainian literature because like I said it's been overshadowed by Russian literature for so long it's time that we um, shed light on that literature and not through obituaries but through the works of writers. Mm. Thank you very much for those recommendations and I can see that there are several more have now popped up in the chat so I think we should we will save this chat and I think we might publish the list of Ukrainian books on, on very, very happy to send the list <laughs> or several <laughs> lists compiled by others. The Cave Independent, by the way, is a is a great outlet and they have a review section as well now. Um check it out and they have their own list of recommended Ukrainian literature in translation. Of course, yes. Thank you. Well, look, uh, Alessia, we we've we've come to the end of, of our hour. I, I, I won't take any more questions. There are one or two which I might pass on to you afterwards, specific requests. Um, but look, th thank you very much. That that was a very, very moving talk uh, and, and absolutely inspiring. It's so full of insights. And the way you, um, the, the, the way your individual stories illuminate that the bigger picture and, and the, the bigger truth is is absolutely fantastic um very challenging too thank so you i hope we will continue to 
hear your voice, keeping Ukraine in the spotlight, helping us to understand the country better. Um, and thank you to everyone for taking part tonight. Uh, keep in touch, support the Bear Trust, um, and support our fundraising for Ukraine. Um, and I, I wish you all a very good evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Slava Ukraini.